Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. And as um, you've heard, I'm going to talk a little bit about the experience over really over 15, 20 years now of trying to promote hepatitis B testing in Asian American communities. Um, so before I talk about this in detail, it may be worth, given the venue, of talking a little bit about the similarities and differences between some stomach and liver cancer. Similarities, they're both associated with infection. As you've heard many times this morning, H. pylori for stomach cancer and the hepatitis B virus for liver cancer. Um, they're both um, very marked health disparities experienced by Asian American communities. And they're both more common among men than among women of, of all races, ethnicities. Differences, some differences in the subgroups. Um, Koreans have the highest rates of stomach cancer, but Vietnamese and other Southeast Asian groups have the highest rates of liver cancer. Japanese Americans experience high rates of stomach cancer, but not of liver cancer. Um, this map just shows you chronic hepatitis B levels worldwide. Um, as you've heard people talk about before, people tend to bring the risk of their home country with them to the United States um, as first generation immigrants. On the map here, the dark blue, as you can see, the highest rates in the world are in East Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, just to show you some Amer US data for liver cancer incidence rates, um, just shows, as I mentioned, that the Southeast Asian groups have the highest rates, though multiple Asian groups are at high risk compared to um, non-Hispanic white populations. And again, just shows that men are at higher risk than women. For those of you who don't know, I just wanted to talk a little bit why, about why hepatitis B testing is important. Um, it's a serological blood test. It allows the identification of individuals who have chronic hepatitis B infection, and those individuals should be screened for liver cancer, may need treatment with antiviral medications, and should take precautions against infecting other people in their community and their household. Um, it also allows the identification of people who have never been, test, um, never been exposed to hepatitis B and would benefit from vaccination. Obviously, one of the differences here between liver and stomach cancer is, uh, is an effective vaccination for hepatitis B. Now I'm going to begin to talk about some of the very early efforts in the US to address this issue. Um, the National Task Force on Hepatitis B was formed in 1997, initially with funding from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. <laughs> And I wanted to mention that the Washington, Washington was really um, one of the four front states in this initiative. And the Washington State Asian and Pacific Islander Hepatitis B Task Force was formed the same year. And the person who actually led this uh, initiative here was an, um, Dr. Anthony Chen, who's now the health officer for Pierce County, and has moved to the East Coast and back since that time, but really was um, spearheaded the eff initial efforts in Washington. Um, the initial mission was to promote hepatitis B vaccination for Asian and Pacific Islander children. But it subsequently and quite quickly expanded its mandate to promote hepatitis B testing among um, adults from those groups. Um, some examples of the early task force initiatives. Um, they, the members advocated for clinical guidelines and organizational recommendations related to hepatitis B testing and vaccination. For example, or one of the groups behind the American Cancer Society's recommendation to promote universal hepatitis B vaccination of all children, um, a recommendation that was, first came out in 2001. The first chair of the task force um, organized multiple national conferences focusing on health disparities experienced by Asian Americans. For example, Cancer Concerns for Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders that was held in San Francisco in 1998, and I had the pleasure of 
attending to talk about some of my work with the Cambodian community. And then also members of the task force contributed to journals, to journal articles. Um, and for example, there was a special issue of, a, of the Asian American and Pacific Islander Journal, journal of Health in 2001, and which focused on hepatitis B and had multiple articles addressing various aspects of the um, problem and the solutions. And that, this, pic, this picture is just of the people who attended that conference in San Francisco. Um, towards the front, um, to the left, is somebody who you'll see again later, um, Dr. Harold Coe, um, Har who at that time was um, a professor at dermatology at Harvard, late, went on to become the um, health director of health for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and is now in President Obama's administration as an assistant secretary, I think. I can't remember what, but assistant secretary, and obviously is a Korean-American. You'll see him later. He's in this presentation. He's been important in many of these efforts. Um, guidelines. You've heard a lot about the importance of guidelines this morning and why the absence of guidelines can um, hold things up. Um, so I want to talk about hepatitis B testing guidelines. Um, as again, you've heard, the guidelines affect healthcare provider practices, and they also infect, affect insurance coverage, which obviously is an issue when cost is a barrier to services. Um, it is now, hepatitis B testing is now recommended for Asian immigrants as well as their US-born children i.e. So first, so first and second generation Asian Americans. Going back over time, key guidelines, the first important guidelines were from the American Association for the Study of Liver Disease in 2007, followed shortly by the CDC um, guidelines regarding testing in 2008. Notably, the US Preventative Services Task Force, which and many of you know is a very important body um, in terms of guidelines and recommendations, only issued their guidelines this year in 2014. So, you know, it's well over a decade from the first efforts before the Preventive Services Task Force issued guidelines. And those are just um, some pictorial displays of the CDC publication when they made the recommendations and the... Um, this, uh, this um, recommendation earlier this year from the Preventive Services Task Force. And one thing that's very important nowadays is under the Affordable Care Act, if the US Preventive Services Task Force recommends something, then um, insurers have to pay for it. Um, so a, pre a guideline from this group is particularly important because it really afford, uh, affects financial access Okay, now I'm just going to talk a little bit about research um, and talk about um, some of the categories of research that has been done over the last um, 10, 15 years and also the objectives of that research. Um, there have been assessments of testing levels in Asian communities, obviously just to collect, collect baseline needs assessment data. Early on, people really had no idea how many people had actually been tested. Assessments of physician testing practices, which are also important, particularly um, physicians serving you know, Asian communities and practicing in areas of the US with um, large Asian immigrant group uh, populations. Um, the identifica and identification of testing barriers and facilitators um, has been carried out among Asian subgroups. Um, those um, studies have used both qualitative and quantitative methods. And then uh, later on, evaluations of interventions. The objectives were to document the need for interventions, provide information to inform the development of interventions, and to identify evidence-based interventions that be, could be implemented in Asian communities. And this is just a summary. I went into the database that the National Institutes of Health maintain and just used some key words to identify the 
projects that have been funded in this area. These are all projects that um, had at least as one objective increasing hepatitis B testing levels. Um, I've been fortunate to be the recipient of some of these grants along with Dr. Carrie Jackson from Harborview Medical Center. Um, the other group, other areas of the country that has received funding for the, these initiatives are Phil Temple in Philadelphia, John Hopkins in Baltimore, and then also multiple sites in California, not surprisingly given the large Asian communities in California. I do want to mention that the Association for Asian Pacific Community Health Centers, um, or APCHO, um, did receive a, a grant from NIH in, a couple of years ago in 2012. And at my understanding, I'm sure there are probably people here from International Community Health Services. Although APCHO is based in California, um, the research work for this project is actually being done at International Community Health Services here in Seattle. Um, okay. So some research, just examples of a couple of research projects. Liver Cancer Control Interventions for Asian Americans, which was funded by the National Cancer Institute, um, evaluated three different interventions for three different Asian communities. It evaluated a lay or community health worker intervention for Hmong, it was done in the Central Valley, a group education intervention for Koreans, and that actually was done at churches in Los Angeles, and a media-based intervention for Vietnamese, which was done in the Bay Area in Northern California. Another example, and I thought you might be interested in this, it was funded by PCORI fairly recently, <coughs> or the Patient the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute. We're all having trouble saying that today. <laughs> um, and it basically it was funded a year or so ago. It's been done in um, community health centers for low income um, immigrant groups in San Francisco and Oakland. And they're basically evaluating a mobile tablet application for Chinese and Vietnamese patients, um, clinic patients, which actually addresses hepatitis C as well as hepatitis B. And I just wanted to show you these as some examples. These are basically some, a flip chart and a brochure that we actually developed for our research project with the Cambodian community here in Seattle. Okay, moving on now, talk a little bit about community programs. Many hepatitis B programs have been implemented in Asian communities since the early 2000s. And a 2008 study identified 50, 55 community-based programs that had previously or were currently addressing hepatitis B testing among Asian American, Asian Americans. So you know, there really was a tremendous community effort and initiatives um, that developed during the last decade um, or decade before. Um, just some program examples, again, the Hepatitis B Coalition of Washington here uh, in our state has been one of the more active um, coalitions in the country. Other examples, the Dallas-Fort Worth Hepatitis B, fraud, B Free Project, the Hepatitis B Initiative of Washington, D.C., Hep B United of Philadelphia, and San Francisco Hep B Free. Um, this is just basically to show you some examples of the activities that the programs have um, implemented, designed and implemented, and also the funding sources. So activity examples have been free screening clinics at healthcare facilities, you know, on a Saturday morning or whatever that would be advertised or promoted ahead of time. Screening events at community organizations, um, Asian language advertising campaigns, and educational workshops in community settings, which would be you know, community-based organizations, church, you know, religious organizations, etc. Um, these programs have variously been funded by pharmaceutical and insurance companies. To be honest, the pharmaceutical companies are quite keen to promote hepatitis B testing because they're very keen to identify carriers who might benefit from their medications. So it's not totally altruistic, I'm afraid. Um, state and county health departments, 
hepatitis B um, hospitals and other healthcare institutions, federal and other grants, and charitable donations. These are just some examples. This is actually from the San Francisco Hep B3 campaign. Um, and these actually, these are sort of posters that were put in community settings. But they had longer um, versions of them that were actually put on billboards and on buses. And so, you know, they would, put, they would put it on buses, say if they were targeting in, within the Chinese language, they would put them on the buses that went through the Chinatown area of San Francisco. So it was like targeted to the bus routes going to certain, um, certain ethnic communities in the Bay Area. So again, that's just an example of what was done in San Francisco. Okay, have I gone, did I skip one here? No, that's good. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to talk about the Institute of Medicine report. I think as most people know, the Institute of Medicine carries a lot of weight. And what the Institute of Medicine recommends and says definitely affects the healthcare community. Um, and they issued a report in 2010, which has recently been updated, a comprehensive report on the prevention and control of hepatitis B in the United States. And this report recommended, specifically recommended focused efforts to address hepatitis B in Asian communities. And this recommendation has been incorporated into national action plans. So No Hepatitis B um, is a national campaign to increase hepatitis B testing among Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. It was launched a year ago, just over a year ago. It's a partnership between the CDC and Hep B United, and Hep B United is a, a coalition of multiple community organizations throughout the United States. Um, the campaign includes online and other print advertisements, public service announcements, social media and digital materials, and outreach to both communities and healthcare professionals. And these are just some of their campaign materials in obviously different Asian languages as well as English. So to conclude and summarize, the efforts to increase hepatitis B testing levels among Asian Americans have steadily gained momentum and a national campaign has now been launched. But as a cautionary note, this is you know, over 15 years since the very first efforts to get to this point. And this is, again, Dr. Ko. I said he would come up again later, and he is the, um, the person at the federal government level who has been, um, had overall responsibility for the implementation of this national program to the point where he actually features himself on one of their posters. That's one of their posters for the campaign. So, so thank you very much. <laughs>